including uh, me. So, uh, but the real reason we wanted to put this house of worship on the tour is not what they do necessarily in here, although they do significant things in here, but what they do out there. And we want you to get a chance to see uh, what they do because it's my belief that the church in America owns a lot of real estate that we underutilize. And this might be a way for you to go back and make a suggestion for some part of this. Because uh, local food distribution and growing it fresh is a need for all of us. Uh, whether you are rich or whether you're poor. And I don't care what Walmart says <laughs> about their produce. It's always better right out of the garden. All right? <coughs> So I'm going to uh, turn this over to Pastor Davies now, and uh, again, thank you for being part of it. And Donna Jean will be back in a couple weeks after she gets through soaking up the sun in New Brunswick, Canada. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, uh, welcome, friends. Thank you very much for coming today, coming to visit with us. We're very excited that, uh, that you're here, and we'd like to be able to tell you our story. So um, part of the Houses of Worship tour, that's very exciting for us. We've uh, participated and gone and visited other churches in years past, and now we get to host everybody. It's just a, a wonderful thing. All right, here we go. So uh, we're a, a United Methodist faith community here. Uh, what that means, United Methodism is a denomination. We have churches. This is one of them. They're gathered together into districts. This church is part of what's called the Maumee Watershed District. There's about 110 United Methodist churches in that district. And then districts are clustered together into a conference. We are part of the West Ohio Conference, of which there's about 1,100 United Methodist churches. That's just in West Ohio. East Ohio is its own separate thing. Then all of those are gathered together all across the country and then all across the world, and we wind up with the denomination that is the United Methodist Church. So the United Methodist Church is a global church. It's not simply an American church. It covers all across the world, and there are conferences and districts and churches in countries uh, spreading the globe. Uh, theologically, we would be Wesleyans. So what that means is that uh, we have our roots in the work and life and theology, principally of John Wesley, who was born in 1703 in England, also his brother Charles, responsible for many of the hymns that you may sing, whether you go to a Methodist church or not. He was a prolific hymn writer. And uh, the Wesleys, the Wesleys began a renewal movement in the Anglican Church in England. The word Anglican simply means of England, Church of England. And in the 1700s, it was a slightly moribund place, and the Wesleys started a renewal movement. They were priests. Turned out that as they started their renewal movement, people became uh, fascinated, but not in a good way, about the fact that they had a method for doing everything. They had a method for what your day should look like. You should get up at this time. You should pray at this time. You should visit the sick at this time. You should visit those in prison. You should worship. You should read the Bible at this time. They had a method that they laid out. And so people, in a very derisive, nasty way, referred to them as Methodists. <laughs> and because uh, John and Charles Wesley are both smart people, they simply adopted the name. They said, you use it as an insult. We'll wear it with pride. And so they became the Methodist movement. And then when that movement came to, in those days, the Americas, Wesley originally went to Savannah, Georgia, and it became ultimately a church in America. So it went from being a movement to being a church. One of the uh, distinctives of uh, Methodism and its Wesleyan tradition is its theological method. All churches have a theological method. Whether your pastor has explained yours to you or not, it's true, you do. And ours is uh, summed up in this bottom line here. We use what's often referred to as the Wesley, Wesleyan quadrilateral. So four things arranged like in a square. Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. 
And we apply all of those things to understand who we are, where we are, what we are doing in the world, what is the purpose of our being here, what is the function of the church. That's our method. Now, there are a few things uh, theologically that are distinctively Wesleyan. Distinctively Wesleyan. So, experiences that one might have in a, in a Wesleyan type of church, of which the United Methodist Church is one, but there are others. There's the Free Methodist Church, the Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, there's the Wesleyan Church, and so on. They all trace their roots back to John and Charles Wesley. One of the things you will notice is that they have a, a, an emphasis on the grace of God. Uh, the Wesleys had a very, uh, very refined and detailed understanding of the concept of grace. And for them, if we were to list all of the things that are important, grace would be top of the list. The other thing that's distinctively Wesleyan is what's called the doctrine of assurance. The doctrine of assurance says that you can be assured of your relationship with God, and you may have no doubt about it, and you may not be frightened about it or worried about it. It is safe and secure. Like if you're a hymn singer, you might know the song, Blessed Assurance, Blessed Assurance. It's a song of assurance. We are assured of our relationship. That's the second thing. And the third thing that's a Wesleyan distinctive would be uh, our doctrine that's called the doctrine of Christian perfection. And what that means is that Wesley believed, and I believe too, that God's promise to perfect you in God's love is real. And you can achieve it today. Don't wait till tomorrow. You can do it today. So that doesn't mean that you get to be a perfect human being and not make any mistakes or anything like that, but it means God's love can be perfected in you. Or as Wesley would say, we may not think the same, but surely we can love the same. That's the idea. And we can do it today. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. So those will be Wesleyan distinctives, and if you go to a Methodist church, those are the sorts of things you should hear in the sermons that uh, the pastor is preaching if the pastor is authentically Wesleyan. So, um, let me give you a little history about this church in this place. Um, I'm Julian, and I was, on July the 1st, 2006, appointed by the Bishop of the West Ohio Conference, at that time his name was Bruce O, unusual name, to plant a new church. So, so I set off to do that. I spent about nine months just meeting people, endless cups of coffee, apple pie at my house, lunches, dinners, breakfasts, nine months talking to people about a vision for what church might look like. Now, when you start off to plant a church and you have nothing, nothing, we didn't, have, we didn't have Bibles, we didn't have a place, we didn't have any people, we didn't have any money. So what did we have? We had, we had a vision. And so I talked to people about vision. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. This is how the church can be part of that, how one can grow the kingdom. Nine months. And then we had uh, gathered together enough people that for four months we met and we learned how to do worship with each other. You have to learn how to do that if you've never done it before. And we did that for four months at what was then Asbury United Methodist Church on Door Street. They were gracious enough to let us use their gym, and we met in there. We learned how to do worship. And then uh, we began weekly services, and we met at the Driscoll Center at, on the University of Toledo's campus. That's the one building that's part of the University of Toledo that is on the wrong side of Bancroft Street. Everything else is on one side. The Driscoll Center is on the other side. And we would meet in there in the Driscoll Center. Uh, we, would, we rented it, and we would rent it for four hours on a Sunday night. We would have to take everything in, like all of this, <laughs> do church, and take it all back out again. And we did that for two years, eight months. And then I decided I was too old for that. It was just, <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of hard work. And my own background, uh, for many years, I was a faculty member at the University of Toledo. Uh, my home department was the chemistry department. And so we did church in the same room that I used to teach sophomore organic chemistry in. The, uh, the, the strange thing was, when I taught sophomore organic chemistry, I had no trouble filling all 374 seats, which is how many there were. But when you start a new church and you've got mm, 30 or 40 people and you spread them across an auditorium with 374 seats, 
yeah, it was, it was hard. It was hard doing church like that. And then we had the opportunity to relocate to this site, which for us was a real blessing because this site is midway in between the university's main campus and its medical campus. And in fact, the Scott Park campus, if you were to draw lines connecting them, they form a nice little quadrilateral. And so uh, we relocated um, May 2010, so we've been here just about three years in this site. Uh, inspiration for uh, starting this church is found in the second chapter of the book of Acts. That's a scriptural inspiration. And I show you the last few verses of uh, the passage from Acts 2, verses 44 through 47. It's a description of church. This is the early church. Does church as you know it look like this? All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, not just on Sunday, day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. That's what the early church looked like. It's a day-by-day -day thing. It's not a Sunday thing. It's a day-by-day -day thing. And the church is all who believe. The church, of course, is the people, right? We know this. In Greek, it's the ecclesia, the people who are called out into the public square. So that was our inspiration. And from that, we sat down, and over this nine-month period of conversation, we came up with a list of what we call core values. The core values, all groups of people have core values, whether they articulate them or not. You have them. These are ours. They're arranged so they spell Acts 2. And they describe for us things that are important to us. So what's important to us at the University Church? Community is important to us. Reaching out to all of God's people is important to us. Seeking peace and justice, that's important to us. Being Christocentric, Christ-centered, and spirit-led through prayer, that's important to us. And so is teaching and me mentoring and guiding through small group interactions. You know, church on Sunday is a terrible time to meet people, talk to people, share with people, right? Because you're all just sitting there and you can't speak to the person down there and so on. So little groups of people to do that. Seeking to meet the needs, needs of individuals and the community, that's important. Principally, of course, it is transformation that matters. Transforming individuals, the church, the community, and ultimately the world. That's what Jesus sought to do. We try and do worship uh, that's relevant and vibrant and alive. And we try and be open and honest and have integrity in all of the things that we do. So, for example, at this church, any person who's part of this church can come in and say to me, I'd like to see the accounts for the church. Of course you can. It's your money. <laughs> Take a look. You gave it. Here it is. Here's where it's going. What do you think? So just try and be open and honest about all things like that. So those are our core values, and those are the things that inspire us. And then our vision, a vision is something you see in front of you, and you try and work towards it. It's a future. You try and reach into the future and embrace it and pull it back into the present. So we envision a faith community devoted to reaching out, finding meaning in life, improving the community, re-envisioning the church, and ultimately transforming the world might sound like words. It's not. We are about the business of the transformation of the world. That's what we want to do. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, that's what your mission is. Your mission is to get to your vision. So our mission, we understand that as building an authentic, in other words, an Acts 2 Christian community that seeks to reach those outside the faith, introduce them to Christ, and grow together in discipleship. When you look at somebody's mission statement and you want to understand what does that mean, my suggestion is you go through and you find all of the gerunds, all of the words that end I-N-G. In ours, building, seeking, reaching, introducing, and growing. Those are the things that you will see us doing, those things. Uh, and then when we moved into this building, we sat down as a, as a community. We had a series of meals on Sunday nights after church, and we worked through a little process to figure out what we would do in this new place had a big piece of land. It was a different neighborhood than the one we had been meeting in on the university's campus. What would we do? 
We developed a process for that. I won't go through all of the details, but it was a lot of fun. And we came up with four big ideas. These are visions. These are goals. Goal number one, uh, we'll be a church that opens the way for people to encounter God in many different ways. Goal number two, we'll be a global church that values and appreciates and learns from other cultures. Our third vision is that all children in our neighborhood will be safe, cared for, and valued. And the fourth one is that there will be no people left hungry in our neighborhood. Those are our four goals. Those are the four things we do. Once we determined what we were going to do, we sat down and we realigned our budget and our spending and our personnel to do those four things. Those are the four things we do. There is no fifth thing. You might come and say, I have a great idea. We should do such and such. And I would say to you, that is a fantastic idea. You should do that. But we're doing these four things. <laughs> so those are the four things we do. And that's pretty much uh, the end of the story here. So let me just run through briefly the four things here. We'll be a church that opens the way for people to encounter God in many different ways. One way, of course, is, is in worship. Yes, it's supposed to be a place where you encounter God. So we do worship here on Sundays at 10 in the morning and 6 at night. The type of service we have, if you're not familiar with a typical United Methodist Church, it's called a service of word and table. The word, of course, is, is the reading of scripture, the proclamation, in other words, the preaching part. But then there's also the encounter with the word. Remember the word the Logos, Jesus is the word made flesh. So we encounter in the table. So we have the word, you see that's the book there, sim symbolically. And then we have the table, communion there. In other words, we serve communion every single time we meet. Every single time we meet. Our services are a service of word and table. That's what we do. And a typical service would look like this. We'd have a little brochure that you'd open up, and it would have a prelude and then a welcome and greeting from me. We'd talk a little bit about life in the community. There'd typically be a responsive call to worship, a hymn, prayers of the people where we seek to support each other in our prayers, but also in other ways as well. My message is always you should pray with your eyes wide open so you can see every opportunity to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world. And then we'll have a song, and then an Old Testament reading, usually a special music piece by one of our music people, a New Testament reading, a message, um, followed up by a praise song or a hymn, then uh, the sacrament of Holy Communion. We'll say the Lord's Prayer together. There'll be some sort of sending forth or benediction. There's an opportunity for uh, an offertory. We don't, like, pass a plate around or anything like that. I, I just don't think it's uh, a good idea. It just is... Uh, the church is, is supposed to be about freeing people from guilt and shame, not guilting them and shaming into, into putting money into something if they can't feed their children, right? That's just wrong. So our offering basket is by the door. Steve is standing right next to it now in a symbolic way and pointing at it. But, so people can, people can contribute uh, as they are able, and people, people with lots of resources from them, much is expected. And people who have no resources at all it's up to us to provide them resources, not the other way around. Uh, and then we, we will end with the, the centuries-old Christian tradition of the passing of the peace. You know, find somebody you don't know very well, say to them, may the peace of God be with you, and they respond, and also with you. And then a postlude. And then in the evening, we always go out to dinner after church. We go to some local restaurant. We have a number of them. We sort of cycle round and round and round. And this will be your opportunity to sit down across from the preacher and tell them how much you hated the sermon, how you thought everything he said was wrong, stuff like that. And we do this every week. Um, when I, before I was a pastor and I would go to church, it was always mysterious to me that you couldn't ask questions. It just was, because I'd spent most of my life as a teacher, and the way you know that you've engaged people in a classroom is when they ask questions, right? And so in church, when I first started going to church, I said to the person sitting next to me in the middle of the sermon, is it okay to ask questions? And he went, no, 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 you can't do that. I said, well, why not? I don't understand. I don't understand what you just said. It doesn't make any sense to me. So I thought, well, you know, now we have our own church. There should be an opportunity for people to talk and continue the conversation that we begin in worship and the sermon and the scripture readings, um, you know, and share their thoughts and their opinions too. So that's what we do. We do that every week. Um, then we have also uh, ways for people who are 
Perhaps they don't want to physically come into church. If you've never been inside a church, I can tell you from first-hand experience, walking through the doors of a church is incredibly intimidating. It's very difficult to do. So we make everything we do available. We live stream our services by video. There's, in fact, a little uh, handout that was on most of the chairs, I think, that describes the sort of electronic resources. You can participate almost completely in the life of our community electronically. We have people across the globe and in other parts of the world who will they'll watch the service on their iPhone and you know text comments and messages and things like that. So and we have our own cell phone application. You know you can go to the the Google store or the iTunes store and get our application. It doesn't cost anything, it's free, but you can go get it and, uh, and it gathers all of our electronic stuff together and you can watch uh, church services there or from our website, everything is available there. So we have this ministry here that reaches out across the globe. In fact, when I first wrote uh, the code for this cell phone application, which was a real challenge, I'd never done anything like that before, uh, the very first person who downloaded it was from Israel wasn't from America at all, was the first person. I thought, wow, that's cool. So, you know, we've got people now across the globe who, who participate in what we do. And then other ways for people to come in and encounter God, you know, sometimes getting together in a smaller group is better. Some people like that. They have a voice. They want to be heard. So we have um, Bible studies every week. In fact, we have a brand new one uh, that starts tomorrow, Wednesday at 6.30. We just finished um, the Gospel of Luke. And so now we're going to move into... Luke's follow-up work, the Acts of the Apostles. So that'll begin tomorrow, six o'clock. And then we have a theology group that meets on Thursdays. This is um, uh, for discussion of the different theological approaches people have taken. You know, theology is almost uniquely a Christian endeavor. Uh, how Christian theologians over the centuries have understood various things that are important to us. What is salvation? What is faith? Is there really a hell? All of these sorts of questions are things that theologians ask. And so we look at that. Right now we're doing uh, a little thing on uh, some modern approaches to understanding what's called the problem of evil. The problem of evil says... If God is all good and all knowing and all powerful and loves everybody and is everywhere, uh, why is there evil and suffering in the world? Because God ought to fix it. So that would be one approach to solving this. Is it, uh, but there are other approaches as well. And so we've been working through some of them, particularly some modern ones. Uh, that's called theodicy, a defense of God in the face of evil. So we do that every week. And then we have music groups. Lots of people connect with God through their music, through their singing, voice, instruments, and so on. And then we have other things where people, we have sort of people who are creative. So we have a knitting group for people who want to sit around. And you know how sometimes, if, if, if I'm sitting opposite you, we might feel obliged to try and talk to each other but if you've got your knitting to do, when it falls quiet, it's okay. Silence is okay. So that's a good thing. And then we have our open mic nights. These are every month. Open mic nights is where we have poets, people who write essays and pieces that you want to read and share, musicians, singers, dancers, people who express themselves artistically. That happens. And then we have game nights board game nights and electronic game nights where we get people together. And again, they fellowship with each other, talk with each other, and sometimes it's in those conversations that the very important questions arise. When we talk about being a global church that values and appreciates and learns from other cultures, you know that there are many churches, many churches, who have people who go off across the globe and do stuff, right? You know this, so that's nothing new. But... Uh, our approach to this is we don't simply uh, go across the, ro the world to some other culture believing that we go into a place where the grace of God is not to be found and take with us the solutions to their problems. We don't do that. The grace of God operates everywhere. The provenient grace of God is operative in all places, in all people, at all times. That's classic Wesleyan theology of provenient grace. And so when we go somewhere, God's grace is already working. And we go to share with people and learn from them, and maybe they'll learn from us too. We are not so arrogant as to think that we can take the solutions to other people's problems. So um, one of the things, one of the places um, we've spent some time is in sub-Saharan Africa. This, these pictures are taken in northern Zambia. That's me with a couple of my Zambian friends. I do a lot of teaching there to a school for United Methodist pastors. I teach theology there. And we have a big project about uh, HIV AIDS uh, education and prevention. 
But while there, we, we learned a lot about sustainable agriculture and how sustainable agriculture works. And we saw people keeping bees and making honey and raising fish and growing food, all centered around the life of a Christian community. And that's a good idea. So we brought that idea back. You see, we'd learn from them. We didn't just go over there and think we, we would take them all the answers. We took them our problems, and they helped us solve them. And similarly, we do a lot of work in Guatemala. We do this in collaboration with a local organization called SoHope that works in the northern part of Guatemala. Lots of people from our church have, have been there. And here we're working on a water purification project and uh, doing work with children, which is one of our areas. And then most recently, our associate pastor, Diana Davis, was just in Brazil doing some um, multicultural work there. We try and learn and bring back, not go over and take answers to questions that the local people probably don't have. So, um, then um, the, other, the third point that we work towards is as our goal that all children in our neighborhood will be safe, cared for, and valued. Now, of course, here in the church, we do lots of things that most churches do. We do children's church during all of our worship services. This summer, we run a series of what are called Youth Summer Saturdays. We have two more left. There were others earlier in the year. Uh, we feed children during the, during the middle of that session. And then there are lots of activities, uh, garden activities, Bible stories, all of those sorts of things go on. And then we have a uh, I think quite significant project with our local elementary school, which is called Reynolds Elementary School. And our school program director is Tiffany Ways, and Tiffany is here, and I asked Tiffany if she would come and share with you this work that we're doing with children. Thank you, Tiffany. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. one of our goals is to really work with the children within the community and so we adopted our local elementary school if a child was to live in this building they would attend Reynolds Elementary School so we thought a natural fit to go over to the elementary school and we really went in there with the idea of what do they need from us how can we be here to serve you instead of going in there with our agenda we went in there with how can we really meet your needs at this school and we went over there three years ago, and so some of the stuff I'll be explaining has happened in the past three years, um, and giving you an idea of what our program looks like right now at the elementary school. This is um, our after school program. We had a walleye um, hockey player come over, and this is a picture of him with our older students. Um, we break our after school program down into older and younger students. So this is the walleye player with the older students. And these are some of the programs that we have over there. We were asked by the principal to really look at the school and really what are the needs of our children. The needs of our children are 95% of our kids are on free or reduced lunches. So we very much represent an inner city school, but we are not in the inner city. So therefore we don't get a lot of the funding that comes along with the inner city. And also our families have significant transportation issues. So what a school is, is a natural center for children. So what we wanna do is make it a natural center for the entire family and community. So some of the things that we've started over there are an after school program. Our children, unfortunately, the biggest time for children to get into illegal behavior is right after school between three and six. So instead of our kids going home and being latchkey kids where nobody's home to supervise them because they have a single mom who's working full time and who gets out of work at three o'clock, um, so we have an after-school program that goes until 6 p.m. And during the after-school program, we give the kids tutoring services. We feed them all dinner. And we also do activities such as gardening, art, physical education, nutrition education. And we do that all between the 3 and 6 p.m. We launched this summer a summer youth program. So that way the kids, um, unfortunately kids in the lower socioeconomic status, they fall behind significantly during the summer months. We want to keep them on par with their peers. So what we do is we run a summer program where we have tutoring. We get to do some of the fun tutoring, experiential learning, going out and doing field trips, learning about um, math through field trips, science through field trips, reading. Um, and we also provide them with lunch because they go from having three meals a day because we have breakfast at TPS, lunch and dinner for our kiddos. They now have none. So we provide them with lunch. 
And we also um, give them, again, the activities. So we have tutoring, lunch, and activities. One of the things that the school has identified a need for them is they do not have library services. We have one librarian to six TPS elementary schools. That's not humanly possible. So we provide uh, volunteers that staff our library so our kids can get access to books because early liter literacy is very important. Um, we also attend all of the major events at the school because um, we have a pretty low parent participation, which we're trying to increase. And so we have event volunteers. We do field day. We do tons of fall festivals, tons of different activities. We also, even though we are only two miles down the road, two miles without a car is very far. So we have a community garden over at the school, and also our kiddos do not get field trips um, very much. So they come out during their science lesson, and they go through the garden, and they learn about the weather. They learn about, we have raised beds out here. What are the area and perimeter of these raised beds? They also learn nutrition because our kiddos go out there, and they pick it pick the produce and they take it back and they have it for snack in their classroom. So fresh um, fruits and vegetables. And it's so neat to see how excited they get about fresh fruits and vegetables. I didn't realize they would get that excited, but it is true, they get super excited. And what really got us started on the community gardens, we had an open house and there was tomatoes sitting there and the kid was like, what is that? And I was like, somebody doesn't know what a tomato is in Northwest Ohio? <laughs> so that's one of the reasons we got the community garden started over there. Um, we have mental health services on campus because, again, a lot of our kiddos cannot get out to services, so we have them right there on campus. We have dental services, um, parent exercise classes. We really want to get the parents in the building. Unfortunately, a lot of our parents have had really, really bad experience with education, so they avoid the school like it's the plague. So they, what they do is they, we're trying to get them back in the building. And while their kids are being taken care of, it's a great time to really focus on yourself. How can I be healthier? And healthy, fam healthy parents equal a better health for a family. And we also um, have a mobile food pantry and a mobile medical van that comes here um, three, or one time a month. It's the third Thursday of the month. And we provide transportation for our families to come over here to that so they can get fresh produce right out of our garden. And then the parents can also see what gardening looks like. And also if they want to participate in gardening, they have the opportunity to do so because unfortunately a lot of our families live in Section 8 housing apartments. And so they don't have a lot of land to be able to do that. So our goal again is to how do we bring the services in to the family? And all of this started really by going in and saying, what do you need? What do you need from us? And the school cannot believe that a church actually cares about them, which is really bothersome, because as a church congregation, we should be really caring about our children. And the one thing I forgot is a school supply pantry. We have a school supply pantry where our teachers, unfortunately, have to provide the school supplies for their kiddos, because really, if it comes between feeding your kids and providing school supplies, I hope you pick feeding your children, um, which they do. And so our teachers then bear the burden of getting school supplies for their kiddos, which is very expensive on their limited income. So what we do is we have a school supply pantry that they come to. It's open once a month for our teachers where we provide them with room full of school supplies, crayons, pens, pencils, scissors, whatever you can imagine um, for school supplies. And they can come and take as much as they want um, for their classroom, as long as it's used within their classroom. So again, it's really about reaching, getting in, and we got to know the principal, we got to know the teachers, the kiddos, the families, and so you walk in that door, they literally think I'm a PPS employee, which I'm not, but it's really good because they don't see our church or us as different than the people who are already there. So we're just, we're just an extension of who they are. And so where we're going in the future for our community school is we're really, really, really looking at getting more parents. I participate in the parent PTO, but really looking at getting specific advisory boards, advisory committees, um, increasing parent activities. How can we get more activities for parents there? And again, kind of jumping down, parent-child interaction stuff. How can we teach our parents to teach their children? Um, and we wanted to go in and do some of these activities with the parents and get to know them first before we are expecting them to come in. So really, I stand at the door and I literally greet every single parent who comes to pick up their child. And so you're really building that relationship. So I'm no longer a scary person. I am one of them. And we also um, are increasing off-campus trips. We bring our kiddos over here to the garden. They absolutely love it. They get to see the animals and they get to taste things, and the kiddos actually just the other day, they're like, can we go back over? We want some fresh strawberries. <laughs> so the last time they came, they got big bowls of strawberries, and they absolutely loved it. Um, and they got to take some produce home, so they really like that, too. 
Um, also, other off-campus trips, um, such as going to the zoo, we're going to go to the Mud Hens games, so things like that, because our kids, unfortunately, lack a lot of experiences, and we've realized with state testings, you have to have, a lot of the questions are experience-based, so unfortunately, if you don't have that experience, then the reality is that you can't understand the questions that are being asked. Um, participation in camps, our kiddos don't get the opportunity to go to camps, we're collaborating with a, a camp up in Michigan that provides camp free of charge to kiddos. Um, and so we're working with them. And we have a really big exciting thing. We have a pediatrician coming on campus next year, which is a phenomenal thing because a lot of our kids miss school um, because they don't have shots. And so we're gonna have somebody right there on campus so our kiddos can get shots, they can get taken care of right there um, once a week on campus for our students. And we're also gonna be having a preschool, which is also very exciting because a lot of parents have asked about preschool for their little kids to get them engaged in the education process. So we're gonna have a preschool, most likely it's 95% gonna happen. And so we're gonna have a preschool. And then student clubs, really positive activities. We just got a Lego grant to have a Lego club at the school. And so really getting different activities. We got physical fitness grants to also do some physical fitness stuff with the kiddos. So this is a little bit about our uh, school. And really, it really blends very nicely. I know Brian's gonna talk about the garden, but it really blends very nicely into our garden, our garden activities. Um, and we go in there really literally with our garden and our school. There's no strings attached. We're coming here, we're showing you love, we're sharing life with you, and really, really, really showing that a church can make a difference in the community. So. Yeah, um, so this is a, 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 has been a big project for, uh, for this church, and uh, thanks to Tiffany. When we started our after-school program, we, we built that up by the end of uh, the first term that we were doing there, I think we had 115, 115 children in our after-school program that we were feeding, and which is quite incredible, really. It's about it's over a quarter of the, the children at the school. So that's been a, a very big thing for, for us. Um, so our, our other goal then, that was about children. Our other one is about that there will be no people left hungry in our neighborhood. This is also a, a big thing for us. Now, Tiffany mentioned we have a, a community outreach on the third Thursday of every month, which is a partnership between us and Food for Thought and a group called Lifeline Ministries who have a medical trailer. And so here at the church, we have the Food for Thought trailer that's full of food, the medical trailer we we arrange for physicians and nurses and so on to be there. Um, we have the o Ohio Benefit Bank people here who do benefit counseling. And then um, Tiffany arranges for transportation from the apartment complexes where most of our families live. And families can come here. They can then get food to take home. But it's not just giving them food because as we give them food, if they're interested, we can take them out into our gardens, where Brian Ellis, our community garden director, who will be speaking to you in a minute, can talk to them about growing their own food and becoming self-sufficient. And they'll say, well, we don't have any tools. I say, no, we know that. We have tools. We don't have any seedlings or seeds. I say, that's okay. We have seedlings and seeds. But I don't know how to do it. I mean, how, do you, where, how far down do you plant this? And Brian says, I'll show you. And so we've now got families who, uh, we have over 50 different families now, uh, growing food here for themselves. So that's a big thing for us. And then we have the opportunity for them to get some um, at least preliminary medical checkups going on. We had a young lady here last month who was five months pregnant and had never seen a physician. We, of course, just by the grace of God, happened to have a an OBGYN here with us, so it was perfect. It just sort of all works out. So um, that's one of the ways that we're um, looking towards feeding. But uh, the big part of the program is our community garden, our community garden whose objectives are about growing food, growing awareness, awareness of the nature of food, of nutrition and health, and growing compassion. And we're very blessed to have as our community garden director, uh, Brian Ellis. And I'm going to ask uh, Brian if he will come forward and say a few words to you about that. Thank, Thank you. you. Just hit this. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Good morning. And is it still morning? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. I wasn't growling enough yet. So. <laughs> So anyway, uh, I'm sure you guys actually you probably heard that rooster. He keeps talking to us out here. Um, 
Yes. Oh, thank you. Actually, actually, I should. Thank you. So I'm sure you guys have heard the rooster that keeps yapping out here. We were mentioning that when we invite folks over here from, um, for our food pantry, um, often a lot of folks, when they first see the gardens and they see all these things, they wonder, you know, they're questioning about where food comes from a lot of time. And uh, it was just made very clear to me just even a, a few weeks back, um, I kind of got in an argument with an eight-year-old boy about where eggs come from. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> But the scariest part about that is his mother was defending him. And uh, yes, and so we have a lot of folks that really don't understand where their food comes from. And uh, I really love educating people. It's kind of funny when a little kid first realizes uh, that an egg comes from a chicken's butt. Ew, that's what I hear. So anyway, we have a lot of fun. I get to see a lot of firsts with a lot of the children and the families that come out here. It's an amazing way um, to really inspire folks to show kids uh, where their food comes from. There's such a disconnect about food these days, and uh, for us, the education on those things. Um, I see children suffering because they're not as physically fit as other children. Um, their grades aren't as good at school. They struggle, and uh, I know Tiffany has a lot of issues at the school. Some kids, they really have uh, uh, attention uh, problems. Um, we can relate and attribute a lot of that to diet. Um, for me, uh, I love gardens for so many different reasons. Uh, it's the coolest place in the world to show somebody God, for one, because he makes food, and it's perfect, and it's right there. And uh, the harvest is really fun, too. Um, in our program right now, I have a staff of about four folks that are out here and volunteers. We're harvesting for our food pantry. Um, the food that we're harvesting right now will be taken over to the school tomorrow when we run the summer program. I show up on Wednesdays with a whole bunch of food. The children in the summer program, they get to bring the food home. Last week when we were there, um, we had some moms. We had these fresh little green sweet peas. They're just so yummy and tasty right now. The mom said, ew, gross, I'm not going to try that. And a couple of the moms did. But the boys, when they came in from the gym, the kids, when they came in there, we kind of had this relationship. Tiffany speaks a lot about the relationship building aspect of things. Um, these young men trusted me because, well, I gave them strawberries a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and Mr. Brian, what's he going to give us this time? So we were opening up some sweet peas, and these young men were just, wow, just, oh, these are good. And all of a sudden, mom's like, wow, my kid will eat vegetables. This is amazing. <laughs> so anyway, it was really fun. Now mom's starting to trust us. Um, and uh, I really, I just, I get such a kick out of seeing these kids try vegetables for their first time or learning where eggs come from or when I can feed a family that just was struggling. Um, it's pretty important to us. Uh, previously, I used to work for um, an organization called Toledo Botanical Gardens, a group called uh, Toledo Gross. And uh, when I ran the farm down there, uh, downtown, um, the, uh, the clientele uh, in North Toledo uh, there were a lot of folks that remembered how to grow food, but it seemed that it really got away from a generation. And when I got to land here with all of this property, we had eight and a half acres, I said, oh my gosh, I got a lot of growing to do here. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and well, I'm very fortunate too, we had just put in our irrigation about three weeks ago, and I don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> Last year was such a bear, just trying to get things watered. This year, I gotta get a canoe out just so I can move it. So anyway, um, you know, I got this PowerPoint thing. I'd really just love to show you guys. My PowerPoint's really out here. It's a really remarkable place for people to see. And uh, how you doing, Helen? Fine, how are you? Great, wonderful. So anyway, um, yes. <laughs> um, so we got started really aggressively just this past November when I came to join the University Church here. Um, boy, do I love my family here. Everybody's really awesome. Um, it's a really unique way for me. I've, I've, I myself have went to a lot of different churches to try to find a niche. Where do I fit in? How do I get out into the community? What I love about community gardening is it doesn't matter who you are. Anybody can go out in a garden. We have things that are wheelchair accessible, things for mobility. And a lot of times folks struggle, at least in my experience, with some churches struggle with trying to find a way to tap the, uh, the, uh, the skills and abilities of those in their congregation. But a garden is such an easy place for folks to get out and really feel a value to actually give back to their community. Um, my experience has been uh, everybody loves it. 
Not always at first, but uh, I can at least get some kids to try things that they didn't before. And uh, uh, there's amazing to me how many people don't know what Swiss chard and kale is. Um, we have so many cool things. But uh, anyway, I look forward to helping to give you guys all a tour out here as soon as, as, soon as we get done. Cool. I think you can use the buttons. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> so.